Hi everyone, welcome to the second part of module one here. We're going to talk in this lesson about arrays. Now arrays are a data structure that you've used a lot throughout your coding experience so far in 220 and 240. A couple of things I'll point out. One is that arrays and array lists, as I mentioned last time, are actually basically the same thing. The way they work internally and the way they store the data is exactly the same. An array list in Java is just like a slightly more convenient way of accessing an array. Also, if for those of you who have used Python before, Python's lists are actually arrays, which to me is kind of confusing because there's another data structure, which we'll get to called a link list, where the data is actually stored in quite a different way, as we'll see. So in Python, a list is actually not a linked list, it's an array. So if you've done Python, lists and Java arrays and array lists are all essentially the same thing. So a lot of this will be kind of review, but we're gonna talk internally about how arrays store their data and how it's accessed. Also at the end of this, we're going to talk about how you access program parameters in a Java program, which you'll need to do for some of your labs and assignments in this class. So we'll look at how to do that for those of you who don't already know. All right, let's get started. All right, so let's start talking about arrays in Java. Like I said, some of this will be review, but we're gonna try to peel back the covers and see what's happening in the computer's memory as these arrays are being used. So arrays are built into Java, unlike any other data structure. Java does have some other data structures like linked lists and things like that in its libraries, but arrays are the only one that have actual syntax support where you have it built directly into the language. The most important thing about arrays, the source of their strengths and also their weaknesses, is that the data elements are stored contiguously in memory, which means that if you have 10 elements in the array, those 10 elements are stored right next to each other in memory. That's not true of all data structures as we're going to see, but it's what makes an array an array. All right, now, if you were to create an array in Java, which you could do like this, I'm sure that code looks really familiar to you all. This makes an array of eight elements that are all of integer type. When you do that, what I mean by storing the elements contiguously is that if you were to open up your RAM and look at what the array is actually being stored as, it would store them in sequential order. So let's say just for the sake of argument that your array is going to be located at address 62,800. That's a totally arbitrary number. You really don't usually know or care what address your variables are actually stored at. But let's say just for illustration's sake that the array starts at 62,800. What that means is that each of those locations in your array is going to be offset from 62,800. Now an integer in Java is four bytes large. So that means that the first element will start at 62,800. Then the second element will be four bytes past that. And then four bytes past that is the third element and four bytes past that is the fourth element and so on and so forth. Directly in memory, the array elements all have space for storing one of whatever the array is supposed to be storing, in this case, integers. And of course, what you do with the array normally is index it with the bracket operator, right? So if you want to put 42 into array slot three, which would be this one, you would say something like array brackets three equals 42. And if you want to then print that out again, you could also read from the slot of the array by using the bracket operator. Now let's talk about what this actually does when you use the brackets on an array like that. Let me go over to the whiteboard real quick and let's look at this. So if we say array slot three like this, how does the computer figure out what actual memory cell array slot three is supposed to correspond to? We know from looking at this that it should be this one, 62812. Well, every time you do array brackets three like this, what the computer is actually doing is a little bit of a math operation. It has to figure out what address it is actually supposed to be accessing. And it does it by starting at the base address of the array, which in this case is this 62,800. Then it adds onto that your index, which in this case is three, times by however big the elements are, the size of each element in the array. So again, in this case, that's going to be equal to 62,800 plus three, our index, 
times the size of each element, which in this case is four bytes. And it's going to add 12 onto that to get 62812. And it's going to use that to go to this address right here. That's what happens whenever you use this index operator in Java. Now, one thing that's kind of important about that is that you don't ever have to like scan through the elements of an array to find one thing. This operation, this address computation right here is just as fast, regardless of if we're finding the third element, element number three, or if we're looking for element number 12,872. It doesn't matter in terms of how fast that's going to access. So with an array, this is probably is something you know, but it's good to be clear about it. With an array, it doesn't matter which element you're accessing, all of them are gonna be equally fast. You can jump into the beginning of the array or the middle of the array or the end of the array. And regardless of how big it is, it's going to retrieve that element basically as quick as your computer, sorry, can do a multiplication and an addition. This mathematical formula for finding out where to jump to in the array only works if the array is stored contiguously in order with no gaps. You can't have an array that like starts at one place and then there's some stuff that's not part of the array and then the array continues on somewhere else. If you were to do that, then this formula would no longer work for finding the things in the second half. So that's why an array has to be stored contiguously. All of the elements have to be right up next to each other with no gaps in order in memory. This is also why, if you think about it, arrays start at index zero. That maybe seemed weird to you when you first got into coding, that the arrays start at zero instead of one, which is how we more naturally kind of count things, but it's because of this formula, right? If you want the first element, it's stored directly at base plus no offset at all. If you start counting at one, then you're going to miss this first element here. So that's kind of where that comes from as well. So arrays are stored in order contiguously in memory. That's the most important thing about them. All right, I think I mentioned all of this. Okay, so now we're gonna move on and talk about multi-dimensional arrays, which are essentially arrays of arrays. There's no limit in Java or most other common languages in terms of how many dimensions you create. You could create a 17-dimensional array if you really want it to. However, that would be really unusual. Um, it's just not very common to do that. Most arrays are one-dimensional arrays. There are some two-dimensional arrays and then a few three and four and five dimension, but that even at that point starts to become pretty rare. Most are one and then two-dimensional arrays are also somewhat common. So two-dimensional arrays are what we're gonna talk about here. The same ideas can be extended past that if you need to. So one thing that's important to talk about is that we think of two-dimensional arrays as a table, like this figure here on the left shows a table of characters that's four columns and three rows. But in actual fact, there's no such thing as two-dimensional memory. A computer's memory is flat and one-dimensional always. So in some way, this 2D table that we think of as being in our 2D array actually has to be flattened out into a one-dimensional thing. There's two ways you could do that. You could do it column major, where you store column by column, like the first column goes first in memory, then the second column, then the third column, and finally the fourth column. But it turns out that Java and most other modern computer programming languages use a row major scheme, which means that you store the first row, and then the second row, and then the third row, and so on and so forth. So this figure shows the logical view of how we look at our 2D array as being made up of rows and columns versus how it's actually stored in memory, which is the first column and then the second column and then finally the third column. Now, when we access the array, we need two indices. The first is the row that we're accessing and the second is the column that we're indexing. So in this case, we're going to access row two, column one, which is this cell right here to put the J in place. Now the computer needs to figure out more, a slightly more complicated formula when it figures out what actual memory address grid sub two sub one corresponds with. And the formula that it uses is given here. 
we look at the address as the start or the base address of the array again, plus the row times the number of columns, plus the column times the size. So let's see what that uh, looks like if we go through an example. Okay, so we said that the address would be equal to the starting address or the base address plus the row we want times the number of columns plus the column we want again times the size of each element. So it's a little more complicated now. Let's see if this works. So let's ignore the base address because that's basically just uh, whatever it starts at. In this case, it looks like we don't have anything added, so we'll just say it's zero. Apart from that, we're going to look at the row. So let's say we want J again. We're going to then do row two, column one. So we'll say row is two. Then we have to multiply by the number of columns. In this case, there's four columns. The reason we need to do that is because we basically have to skip over all of the rows that come before the current row in memory, and each row is four columns large. Then we need to add to that the column we want, which in this case is one, times by the size of each element. If these are characters, they're only one byte large, so we can just put one for that. And so in this case, we get 0 plus 8 plus 1, which equals 9, which is our J location here, is in slot 9. So every time you're using a 2D array, the compiler essentially, the Java compiler, is going to expand this code here into something that looks like this to figure out where exactly in the flat one-dimensional array your column and row correspond with. Okay, so that's kind of complicated. I'm not going to ask you to memorize this or to repeat this or anything. Basically, there's just kind of one or two takeaways that I want you to get out of this. The first is that even for things like this, where it looks like memory is maybe more complicated than it really is, like memory is somehow two-dimensional, that's not really the case, right? Memory is just a flat sequence of bytes that has an address. And so anything more complicated you do has to be mapped onto that flat sequence of bytes. That's the first takeaway. The other one is specifically for arrays. You basically, no matter where you're accessing in the array, it comes down to a simple formula to figure out what address that corresponds with. And again, it doesn't matter how big your row or column or index are. It's just as fast to access any of the elements. All right. So next, we're going to talk about advantages and disadvantages of arrays. So arrays are possibly the only data structure that you have a lot of experience with right now. And you're really used to thinking about arrays and solving problems with arrays. But as I said last time, they're not going to be the only tool in your toolbox after this class. And so it's important to know what the strengths and weaknesses of arrays are. There's a lot of advantages to arrays. Like I said, they're probably the most useful single data structure, which is why Java and other programming languages chose to include them in the language itself. Amongst the advantages are that we can jump directly to any element, element by giving the index. You don't need to scan through or search through to get to the 75th item. You can jump directly there. Second, they're compact in memory you don't need to store anything except for the elements themselves. You don't need any kind of lookup table or links or anything like that. That's not going to be true of other data structures we look at. Next, looping over the arrays is very efficient. Because they're all stored next to each other in memory, that works really well for looping through them, principally because computers have cache systems, which you'll learn about a little bit more in Computer Science 305, here at UMW, and the cache basically makes it so that looping through an array is really very quick and efficient. And last, they're built into Java and many other languages. In Python, they come as lists, and so they're easy to use. You don't have to do anything special usually to use an array, and they work for a lot of things. But there are some disadvantages to using arrays. For one, we have to specify the size of the array in advance. That can be problematic for some programs. Sometimes you don't know ahead of time how much data you're going to need to store. 
So you either need to do one of two things. You either need to make it really, really, really big so that you're never going to run out of space. And that has the disadvantage of wasting a lot of space most of the time. The other thing you could do is make the array somewhat small and then resize it when it runs out of room. As we'll see, resizing an array is not really super efficient. You basically have to make a whole nother array and copy the first one over into it. So neither of those are great solutions. Going along with that, there's no way to append to an array which is already full. In Java, there's no way except for, like I said, to make a whole nother array and copy everything into it. Cells that are not being used will waste space. So that goes along with the first point as well, really. If you make a giant array because you think you might need it some of the time, you're wasting memory the rest of the time. And like we talked about last time, adding to or removing from the middle of an array is not super efficient. And that's the only way to insert or remove from an array data structure. So these are kind of contrasted with the next data structure, the major one that we're going to look at, which is linked lists, which are different from arrays. They have different strengths and weaknesses. They solve most of these problems, but as we'll see, they actually introduce some problems of their own and don't share all of the advantages link that arrays rather have. So choosing the right data structure really depends on what you need to do in the program. All right. So that's about arrays. Like I said, we're not talking super long about them because you all have decent experience using arrays, of course, in your previous programming classes. Next, however, we're gonna talk about program parameters, which isn't something you may have seen before. So in this class, we're sometimes going to run programs and pass them command line parameters. So when you took the 225 class, you ran commands and you passed to those commands parameters. For instance, this command makes a copy of a Java program into a backup directory. And it does that by running a program, CP, and it passes to it two parameters. The first is the name of a text file and the second is the name of a directory. Likewise, if you use Vim, you will pass the Vim program a parameter, which is the name of the file that you want to open. So there's nothing special about these, really. You can make your own programs also take parameters like this. And the question then is, how do you actually get them into your program so that you know what the user passed along? And the answer is with these parameters to main. Now, these have been these two words here have been in every Java program you've written all the way back to hello world at the first day of 220. But probably you just ignore them almost all the time, if not actually all the time. But these are how you actually get these parameters that are sent to your program in. So this program here called parameters.java, it actually looks at this args array and prints out the args that are given. So it loops through from zero to args.length, and for each item in the args array, it prints out what it is equal to. So if we run it like this, Java parameters, like you normally probably run a Java program, nothing will happen. It doesn't have any parameters, so it doesn't print anything. But if we run it again and pass some words into it, it will go ahead and print out those arguments. So you can use this for a lot of different things. They're often used for giving the names of files like data.txt into your program, but they don't have to be used for that. They can be used for any purpose that you can imagine. You can pass numbers in and it'll come in as a string. You can pass anything that you want, data.txt dash n4, whatever you want. And your program will be able to see what was passed in on the command line like this. Now, some of you may be planning to use a command line system like Linux for doing this class, and that's cool. That's what I use as well. Um, but I'm not requiring that actually for 340. So you could use an IDE if you're more comfortable with it, but you'll have to figure out how your IDE lets you pass these program parameters in when you run a program. They all have the option to do it somewhere. So if you're using like uh, Eclipse, for example, you can Google Eclipse program parameters and you will see the way in which you specify what parameters your program is supposed to be run with. This makes it a lot easier to test programs because sort of the alternative 
to passing in the file name this way is to do a thing where you system.out.println, please enter the file name, and then the user has to type data.txt every time they run the program. But this is more efficient because when you're testing it, you can just run the same command over and over without having to test the information passed into the program so much. So a lot of our labs and programming assignments, including your first programming assignment, which is posted now, require you to do the command line parameters like this. So that'll be a good thing to figure out how to do with your IDE if you don't already know how. Okay, so that's all for this lesson. We talked about arrays and how to figure out what address in array index refers to. We talked about the advantages and disadvantages of arrays. And finally, we talked about how to look at the args array to get program parameters into your code so that you can see what was passed on the command line. All right, thanks.